Some people describe the Boom Festival, a counterculture gathering that takes place every two years in Portugal, as a playground for adults. My favorite attraction of this playground is Liminal Village, the cultural, more intellectual area of the festival. It was there, sitting cross-legged on the ground facing the stage, that I first met Ashanti Kunene, a social justice activist, a poet, an artist, the founder of Learning to Unlearn, and our guest today at Waking Youth. The focus of her talk that day was on learning to unlearn, unlearn violence and discrimination to begin making more space for self-knowledge, responsible leadership and wiser ways of being alive. And not long after she entered the stage, I understood I was in the presence of a powerful voice of our generation. Let me give you some context. Picture Ashanti in a long, beautiful dress like a black queen, facing a crowd of mostly, if not entirely, white people. Individuals like myself, privileged enough to afford a boom ticket, indulging in a week away, free from responsibilities, talking about peace and love and oneness, stepping on the land of a country that had one of the first and last colonial empires in Europe. Standing in full presence, Ashanti proceeded to voice heartfelt, much necessary words that are not yet spoken about enough at Boom. If you are in charge of leading others, beware the path, beware the path. At a karmic level, at a spiritual level, like it, don't like it, accept it, don't accept it, you are held to a much higher standard of accountability than those who do not lead others, okay? Walk your talk. And if you cannot walk your talk, stop talking and sit down. Stop talking and sit the fuck down. You are creating more chaos in the world through your lack of coherence. Watching Ashanti from the crowd, I knew then I wanted to bring her onto the podcast. Together, we explore her personal history growing up in South Africa. We delve into Ashanti's involvement as a student leader in the 2015 protest Fees Must Fall, an experience that would further deepen her commitment to social justice. We also talk about the role of intuition in her life and how Ashanti summons the courage with varying degrees of reluctance to live out her calling. I'm Carlota Gitch, and this is the Waking Youth Podcast. How would you begin talking about the spiritual background to your childhood, Shanti? Oh, that's an easy answer. I grew up Catholic. I identify as Roman Catholic. I know that's mm -hmm. very controversial, but mm -hmm. my, my great-grandmother, my grandmother, my mom, they were all ladies of the church, part of the Sacred Heart of Jesus in the Catholic Church, so... Lots of discipline, went to convents. The one thing I will say, because the Catholic Church, if you talk, begin to unravel, you know, global systems of power and all of these things. Mm -hmm. I can be anywhere in the world and attend a Catholic Church service and know where I am in Mass. So I grew up in the, with this religion and it's part of my spiritual grounding or it's like the basis point for my spiritual journey, my, my, my actual, this version of me, the deeply mm -hmm. spiritual version of me now, she started properly in 2020 with COVID because I started doing yoga a lot more seriously, like here at home, you know, so I'm doing yoga like six, seven hours a day. And yoga literally means return back to God. It's a mm -hmm. spiritual practice. It's not a fitness craze, you know, and so I started reading all the esoteric texts and Sanskrit texts that came with my yoga practice and the Vedas and the Bhagavad Gita and like I then got the Quran and so like I, I read across all things, mm -hmm. you know, the more esoteric the knowledge is, the deeper my curiosity brain wants to find out. Yeah. And do you recall even if now you don't necessarily live your spirituality or in this case religion the same way mm -hmm. do you remember do you recall having an intimate experience with the beyond at in your childhood 
What what comes to mind when you think about that? An intimate connection with the beyond in my childhood. Yes, I believed in my inner God power. And then the world happened to me and then I forgot, you know. Like really, the, the younger version of Shanti, like, what? There was nothing, there is nothing in the world I couldn't have done. Like I, I miss, you know, I'm slowly trying to get back to, but I miss the how delusionally self-confident I was because I understood mm. that there was just this thing in me and it's there. And so that's just what it is. Here I am, you know? Um, so yeah, I think that would be the connection is just like that daily, it was never doubtful. I never doubted that I could do anything that I never questioned. I never second guessed that at the moment, something that I felt I wanted to dance or sing or paint or whatever it was, I would just go for it. Like I wouldn't question, oh, you know, like what the conditioning of the world does to you. Oh, what are people going to think? Am I really good at this? Like none of those things used to happen, uh, just because, yeah, in me, I felt that there was, you know, because God is in you, the like the, mm -hmm. the life thing, the life energy in you is God, is the universe, is Buddha, is Allah, it's everything, mm -hmm. that life energy, you know. Mm -hmm. mm. And then I'm going to grab something that you were telling me before we started recording about, mm -hmm. about daring to be in your essence Mm -hmm. And to accept this that you are. Mm -hmm. Tell me more about that. And also in the context of what we were just talking about, of what happened that you were rejecting perhaps a bit. And then there's now the a coiling. reclaiming of that. Uh -huh. What what does that mean to you? What happened there? Yeah. So for a very long time, from since since I was in primary school, actually, I've it's always been a thing of whenever I speak, my peers, they, they listen. Like, not because I asked you to listen to me, but whenever, she, whenever I say something, it has always been a, a case that, I'll, and I'll give you an example. My first year was 18. It was first year at Wits, at Wits University in Johannesburg. And we're all sitting at like the first year's table, right? Like it's your initiation Week. So it's like a group of girls. I think they're like, might have been 30 of us at this long table. I'm talking to this girl next to me. I, for the life of me, I can't remember what I was telling her. But halfway through my thing, I noticed that the entire table has now gone silent to listen to me talk, you know? And so that was the moment I realized that, oh shit, I actually do carry a voice that makes people stop and pay attention. And for a long time, that scared me because that meant that I can't just be a normal mm. young person. You know, I can't just like talk whatever. I can't just do anything because time and time again, on, on at least three occasions, this has happened where I've been out with my friends just misbehaving and somebody heard me and it got back to my family and now I'm in trouble, you know, for being loose with my mouth mm. <laughs> or with my behavior. And so I realized that there were consequences that I did not fully understand to the, to my behavior and my words, which then obviously comes with the recognition of the responsibility of that. You know, it's like people that you pay attention to have to hold themselves to a higher standard of account because you're judged harsher. You're, you know, people are paying closer attention to. So, so between the ages of like 18 and 25, 26, mm -hmm. I just, I was upset with God. I was like, no, sorry, I didn't, I, um, I didn't sign up for this. <laughs> no, I like, what is this? Why yeah. can't I just be a normal girl, you know? And then I was part of the student movement mm -hmm. at Stellenbosch University with Fees Must Fall. I ended up being a student leader again, again, this thing of when, when I talk, people listen. And and let me ask you there, mm, mm. I saw somewhere that you, you described it as a baptism of fire into black consciousness. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. And you were a student leader. What does that mean in that context? And how do you rise to be so, the leader? What's this, What happened? Yeah. So what that means is... Fees Must Fall was a baptism of fire for me into black consciousness because I... 
grew up a token black for lack of a better phrasing. I'm a coconut, you know, grew up in white suburbia, went mm. to white schools, had white friends. I'm the token black that speaks well. I'm the, I'm the okay one, you know, I'm not like the others. And then you get to Stellenbosch University and this token blackness helped me get into student leadership. Out of 54 mm. university residences, I was the only black girl who was in a head student role. And I happened to be head student of the largest uh, student residence on campus called Metanoia. Metanoia is a Latin phrase for change of heart, change of mind. And that was the university's message to the world to say, as Stellenbosch University, which is both the epistemic and spiritual birthplace of the apartheid system, we want to have a change of heart and change of mind, right? So me being a diverse head student was good for this. And then the student protest movements happened while I was in leadership. And so what that meant was I had you know, students on campus looking to meet and asking really, Shanti, as a black student leader on this campus at, at this time, what side of history are you going to fall on? Mm. Are you going to continue to toe the line and enforce the rules? In effect, continue to be a house nigger for the master, for the white university, or are you going to use your privilege and power as the token black that has found access to help us uh, further these conversations? And yeah, it for me, a number of things uh, took place. So for that historical moment, because of the questions we were asking, because I'm also a, a born free, supposedly, they, those were conversations I wanted to have about the nature of our freedom, about the nature of education. Like, what is the purpose of education if not to help you think critically and independently? That is also the purpose of university, that mm -hmm. you begin to question the knowledge that you're given. And so that experience then propelled me. I got my first TED talk, then my second TED talk, I went to social justice, and then I went into education technology. Like I found myself now doing things with a social justice lens because what, what awoke in me mm. that day, and I speak about this in my TED talk, is that mm -hmm. we are just asking questions. We're, we're just trying to have a conversation, right? And for the university and the, and the state to respond the way they did really upset me because my whole life you've told me I'm a born free. Excuse me. My whole life you've told me I live in a free democracy. So what is this that I now suddenly have to adhere to apartheid era laws? That day at Stellenbosch University, we held a sit-in. A sit-in is a very peaceful type of protest because there weren't a lot of us, a lot of black <laughs> students on the campus anyways to begin with. So maybe 15, yeah, 12 to 15 of us. We host the sit-in at the library. We got forcefully removed from that space because apparently, and this is the notice that they gave me as the leader of this sit-in, that you are in contravention of Act 6 of the Trespass Act of 1959. This was 2016. So, yeah. and as a born free, that was the day democracy broke for me because I was like, well, no ways. I've been following the rules. I've been a good girl. I've been doing everything. And then you have the caucasity, Caucasian audacity to have put us through everything we've gone through. We come to democracy. We say it's fine because Ubuntu, 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 because I am a person, you are a person. I recognize your personhood. So let's get it together. We did this. And then some 20 something years later, you, you're still behaving this way. Something's got to give. Something's mm. got to give. And there has to be a level of tough love now given, right? And this is why. I also appreciate you recognizing the courage it took for me to say what I said at Boom, because something's got to give, it's enough. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's like the, the, the misbehavior, the disabuse of power is enough. Mm -hmm. Really not. It really mm -hmm. is. And that ancestral rage woke up in me uh, at Stellenbosch because suddenly after being a good girl and being their token black head student, because now I'm participating in conversations they don't want me in, now I must cower. Now I must bow. Now I must accept the narrative of being a poor black woman in Africa, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that really 
woke me up to the ways of the world and the world is crazy. So if everything is crazy, then I'll rather live in my own crazy world where everything is for my good. <laughs> I don't mm. entertain anything else, you know? Yeah. So long way to say that Fees must fall, coupled with the experience that I had, coupled with what I was studying, which is international relations. The, the further I studied about the global system, the angrier I got because I couldn't understand why African leaders agreed to the system. Like, I don't understand why we agreed to this. And the only reason we agreed is because our hearts and minds had been captured into a narrative that told us we are not worthy. We are not capable. We cannot do anything without the assistance of the West, right? Mm -hmm. And... I was a child, a black child that grew up being told and being affirmed and knowing that I can do anything, nothing, nothing, no, what? <laughs> I can be and do and experience anything I want. So anything that I see in my mind's eye, I can manifest for myself, you know? And so part of the calling and part of the reason why I do this work was that I also recognize that that is a consciousness that not a lot of people of color carry the, the, the socialization into whiteness is very deep. You know, you are from birth taught to believe mm -hmm. that you are less than, that you have to work twice as hard to get half as much. That's a narrative a lot of people of color would recognize. You have to work twice as hard to get half as much as the white man. Why? Why do I have to do that? Mm -hmm. Whose rules are those? Mm -hmm. Who said, who said that those are the rules and whoever they are, I don't agree. <laughs> I don't want to work twice as hard for half as much. I want to work just as hard for just as much. Excuse me. You know, like it doesn't make sense. And because, like I'm saying, because the world is crazy, choose to then not participate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because the nature of these oppressive systems that it requires our, partic our active participation. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. It works because we participate. Mm -hmm. Shanti, I'm curious... Mm -hmm to explore something with you yes that you mentioned at boom and some other places and and, yes, and just now you were describing a bit of your context are you where are you from are you from johannesburg so, yes, i was born in i was born in johannesburg but i live in the western cape i will i live in a small town called the wilderness it's right by the beach mm. <laughs> the little mm -hmm. forest as well <laughs> yeah yeah um and you and you've You've described your background and this context growing up as a, um, a context with relative privilege. So yes. we go as deep and as personal as you mm -hmm. are comfortable with. I'm curious to explore, because in Boom in particular, you opened up about mm -hmm. a member in your family being an addict. I'm curious mm. how... The mm. lesson that I was trying to share or the question that I was asking the audience at Boom, because like I had explained at the beginning, I, Boom is... That was my first time at Boom. Like, I don't even listen to Psytrance music. I didn't know what it was until I got the invite because I'm not Googling what the hell is Boom Festival, right? And the reason why I don't is because that crowd does a lot of drugs, like hardcore drugs is just part of the scene and I, mm -hmm. I generally don't keep friends around me that do hardcore drugs even recreationally because the question that always comes up for me is what is it about your just yourself that you can't stand that you're running away from because you know mm -hmm. we're exploring different states of consciousness why what 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 don't you like about your current state of consciousness that you're f trying to go elsewhere you know, mm. and most people don't have a, a clear enough answer to that question because you actually haven't sat with yourself to find out what it is. With my family, like I know what it, what it was in my family, it was poverty, you know, poverty and the constraints of capitalism, just like a tough life in the township. So you can understand what the impetus for the escape was. Mm -hmm. So why I was sharing that story was that in the drug taking, Outside of these, you know, scientific contexts where you're doing some sort of study or research or what have you, if you're just taking 
Ketamin recreationally. Like, this is what happened to me at Boom. I met these three amu- amazing, beautiful people. We're taking a walk from one end to the, and suddenly they want to stop for like a, a smoke break in my mind. No, these people want to do ketamine. I asked the girl, ketamine, what? Do-? Cause it sounded, it sounded so hectic. I'm like, what's ketamine? And then she goes, it's a kind of horse tranquilizer. My brain immediately spazzed. I was like, wait, what? We're just stopping randomly to take a line of horse tranquilizer like you're popping a cigarette. Hmm. Why? Like, I, I, hey man, each to their own. But like, that's my, my, that was what yeah. I was trying to get us mm-hmm. to reflect on. Like, what, what, what is happening that mm-hmm. this is something that you need, you mm-hmm. know? And even if it is a recreational thing, same thing, I suppose, with alcohol and cigarettes. Those are just legal drugs, but they do just as much damage over the long term. You know, I think if you, the ask was just to say that have a reason. If you're going to be doing something bad for your body, you know, Mm -hmm. that it's bad for your body. Smokers know that it's bad for them. Like I smoke, I know it's bad for me, but like, you know, Mm -hmm. you need to have a reason for why you're slowly killing yourself because that's what it is. Mm. And so that's the drug taking because you're, it's an externalized issue that you have not resolved in your self-conscious that is now Mm -hmm. manifesting itself in this habit that is like a slow death, you know? And let me, just a parenthesis, because I actually came up with some friends, with this visual metaphor of the altered states of Mm. consciousness and how we personally sit with it is you have the base reality, which is the base normal consciousness, and then you have all of these other planes. And for us, the interest is, okay, let's travel to this plane because by going here, you gain perspective on how you're operating here. And then that might mm-hmm. bring you insights of things that you feel just like you're in an altered state when you're meditating, for instance, and then you bring that to enrich this. But then the key thing is not wanting to stay here. The moment you want to stay here is the moment you have an addiction. <laughs> Do you understand? Yeah. And not just, not just the moment... I I have to stay there is that or that what you've just described you can do without drugs yeah like that is that is breath work breath work to travel to a, that is literally you want to travel to the different planes of consciousness because they are there they exist that's just breath work why do you need the ketamine or the thing or the whatever external to take you to an internal place when mm. you are already there internally that's the question right because it's no longer about, oh, no, I'm trying to gain perspective. No, you are, baby, but you're taking a way that's going to hurt you in the long run. Mm-hmm. Just breath work your way to where you're trying to go mm-hmm. if the perspective is what you're trying to reach, you know? That's how, that's how I feel. I, I, I do agree, but it's like, you know, one, we want to stay there, and two, I can't get there without this external thing from me. And that's now where, you know, when you talk about big farm and addiction, if you look at what's happening in North America right now, like... You know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, what was your peak experience at Boom that you also talked about? You said you were having a peak experience or that was just just being. Okay, I see. Just being Uh at Boom with thousands Mm -hmm. of white people who are camping or not washing or doing drugs. It's dusty. Like, wait, what? Mm -hmm. You know, I really, I'm actually also proud of myself that I went there because that's, I I was so far, far, far from my comfort zone. I really, yeah, no, no, no. I'm, I'm, it was a life changing experience. And I've come back and told everybody that you have to do boom at least once. Mm. You have to do boom at least once, you know, to get to see and engage. But I found it really intense. I found it like another world, like all these really privileged people have come to escape whatever it is that they're dealing with, you know, seven days of escapism. That's mm. what I saw, really. So in the what, dancing, you know. Yeah, yeah. So in what way was it life-changing for you to see that so bluntly? To see that so bluntly and the life-changing was that normally I would have just checked out and said, no, I'm not going. Mm. No, thanks. You know, but that I traveled and I made it and I had the experience and I was topless on the beach in front of people and like, you know, doing really free things in the midst of like all the witnessing. Yeah, it was, was, it was a really, 
life-changing experience for me because it also opened my mind. I also got to hear about psychedelics in a context other than addiction mm -hmm. and trauma and, 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 because there are a lot of like, you know, really highbrow academics there, et cetera, et cetera. So I learned stuff and yeah, I like to learn. If I'm learning, then I'm a happy girl. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And then your father, and this is something that you did say, I believe, in that day yes. at Boom, that you put it so poignantly and so pressingly that this mm. this daily choice of yours to choose life. Yeah. So how was that for you? How did that impact you? How did that shape you with your dad? It's the reason it's the reason why I do the work that I do. It's, he is the reason why I do the work that I do because my father was like, not the, his suicide took us by surprise. Let's put it that way. Father was tall, big, proud, loud, present, energetic man, just like, you know, and then to hear that he shot himself was a journey also of beginning to understand that, oh shit, mental health is an actual thing. Like we need to talk to each other. It cannot be because my father's story is such that he didn't have anyone to talk to because nobody believed that black people can have mental health issues because mental health is a privileged thing for white people. Only white people can afford, afford being the key word to sleep all day. And so my dad sleeping all day Nobody recognized that as a sickness. They just saw him as being lazy because you're big and you're black. And well, what do you mean? You have to work. And so when his death happened, it really, for me, showed the importance of open, honest communication, especially when you say we love each other. This is a core value of mine. Mm -hmm. Moral accountability and open, honest communication is particularly when we say we love each other, because if you love me, You have to be able to tell me the, the tough thing. You have to be able to tell me, Shanti, no, you can't, you've got tissue paper stuck to your derriere, ma'am. You can't walk out the house like this. Fix yourself, then leave the house. You have to be able to tell me and not be fearful of my response because you're telling me a tough thing. Do you get what I'm saying? And so, yeah, Papa. I'm, I'm obviously also still grappling with what that means to have grown up without a dad, with a father that shot himself. But it's just like, it's an everyday thing. How old thing. were you? I was 14. I was 14. 14. My parents divorced wow. when I was 13. Mm -hmm. They divorced each other when I was 13 and then he, he shot himself a year later. And yeah, man, I think being a man in this world is hard because patriarchy also says you need to be a certain way. And this is also why everything is breaking because men are socialized into being a particular way, but they're not given the tools to be providers. And then girls now we're hyper independent. We don't need no man, you know? And so like, it becomes this strange interaction and encounter. And so I, I, from a spiritual, peaceful point of view, because my name means peace, Shanti means peace, you know? Mm -hmm. so it's like you you need to have peace, bro. And you need to, your home needs to be your safe place where there is always peace. There cannot be violence in your home. Mm -hmm. There's enough violence out in the world, but where you are, your personal space. So very, very, very intentional, but I do not give when my cup is empty. If my cup is empty, don't talk to me. Don't ask me anything. Like, I'm not going to do anything. Wait until my cup is full. Then you will get the best of me, you know? Too many of us give and give and give and work from a point of depletion and then wonder why our bodies start to give out and we are sick and you have headaches and you're depressed and anxious because you're not listening mm -hmm. to your own needs, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have to put the mask What is this in the plane? If the plane's going down, you have to put a mask over yourself first, then help others. It's, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. that's, that's, the, that's the big lesson, you know. And also, because life is beautiful. Life is marvelous. Life is awe-inspiring. It's like, have you seen a sunset lately? How can you look at a sunset and not be just filled with awe? It's wondrous. It's magic. And I, yeah, I choose to live in the magic in the midst of all the chaos, you know? Mm -hmm. Really, really. Yeah. I want to explore a bit this process of becoming professionally. That is not professional only, it's a calling of yours. Mm. Mm. You choose international relations. At that point, when you make that decision, did you have 
a seed, any awareness that that you wanted to to be engaged in social justice in your work? What made you make that decision back oh, then? Um, we in high school we went to go see. I don't know if you guys have these things where like career days, go look at the universities, choose which degrees, and then you Mm -hmm. listen to different lectures by different professors. And the professor that captured me the most was the one who was running the international relations course because he was also something, something at the UN and his work just sounded exciting. Just like international travel, different people, different cultures, languages, ah, the experiences I'll be able to have. So that is what drew me to international relations, to be honest with you. I've also also always been intrigued by power. Mm. Power is a very curious thing. It makes people either really good or really bad, you know, like money, power and money make you either really good or really bad. And there's a saying that says money and power, they don't make you things. They just reveal more of who you are, Mm. you know? And so I've, I've always wondered what I would look like at my most revealed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the writing was it was it always present present oh, yeah. throughout I've your life? I've always journaled. Mm-hmm. <laughs> one day, one day, mm-hmm. I will, somebody when I'm dead, long and dead, will publish all my journals and make a film. I'm sure. <laughs> mm-hmm. But yeah, I I journal. I think journaling is my way of keeping track of myself and the self-awareness because practicing self-awareness is also a very, very important something to be doing if you're, you know, also wanting to grow in your own leadership praxis, et cetera, because you need to know what you thought, what you felt and what you did each day, because that, 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 that feeling, thinking, doing cycle is the, generative principle of creation that's what creates your reality so every the things that you think do and feel every day consistently uh, accumulate to become your life so a daily practice of self-awareness and keeping track of those things is important Mm -hmm. obviously that that modality of journaling of keeping track of my thoughts happened as I got older but like as a young girl I'd always dear diary today I have a crush on this boy and you know so Writing and journaling is mm-hmm. good. It's good. It's good for one so. And when does poetry comes in more seriously? Oh, no, path? the poetry has always been there. Just mm-hmm. I, I only perform when asked. I'm not a, the poetry is like the most intimate practice that I have. So I journal, mm-hmm. I paint, and I write poetry. I paint when I run out of words. Do you understand? So you'll journal first and then I can't quite capture what I'm feeling. Then I'll maybe write a poem and then that's just not working. So then I'll pay the thing. And so by the time I'm done, I should, you know, have figured out why I was feeling however I was feeling or mm-hmm. what was going on. But these are all just like healing practices, man. Ways to keep sane, you know, mm-hmm. ways to manifest all that comes up within me because all your experiences all your feelings are valid and they're true and they have to go somewhere they have to find expression even anger sadness hate if you feel it they have to find expression in something and so part of the alchemical test is to you know alchemize whatever negative experiences and feelings you're having into something positive you know so that's how I alchemize my sadness and my depression and my anxiety. I paint, I paint bright colors and I just, you know, I get it out of my system because if it sits there, it festers and it becomes, you know, acidic for your bones and then your joints start hurting. Mm. Um, everything within you must come out. And if you are afraid of the things that are within you, find a manageable medium or bridge between the inner and the outer because if you fear the thing that's within you you must fear even more that thing when it comes out when it seeps out in a way you cannot control because it will it will it will find a way to come out so rather let it come out in a way that you're able to handle and control and curate than you know suddenly one day finding yourself losing your mind because there's some unresolved issue that you didn't address Mm. however many years back and now suddenly it's messy you know what I mean so yeah Mm -hmm. and then you've shared before 
today here mm. Mm. that there was this hesitation, this process of coming in or this process that is still happening inside you of coming into acceptance with your calling. And when I look at your professional timeline, this <laughs> urgency of doing something that is directly of service is, is very present in all the experiences that you yeah, had yeah. And, and, and the activities that you're now participating in, including your project, Learning to Unlearn. So could you tell me a little bit about this process of becoming professionally, some experiences that were perhaps most formative or what calls you now to do this work or what Learning to Unlearn learning means to, unlearn. to you? Yeah. Mm-hmm. How you even mm-hmm. came to this idea of this project, this personal project yeah, of yours. Yeah. So, okay. So Learning to Unlearn is a decolonial narrative consultancy that I run because I'm often asked to help people understand white supremacy or racism or, you know, all these big isms. Um, and I love the, you, you, you say this with a reluctancy that again brings me to, you know with the to the to this dance with accepting and rejecting the color I just, people come no, to me and they ask me to do this work <laughs> they do and they do and i don't know what i'm supposed to tell you uh-huh. like, but this is this is also how this is also how you figure out mm. what your calling is in mm. life. Something keeps coming back to you, keeps coming back to you, keeps coming back to you. Then you need to start paying attention at some point, you know, because this thing of, oh, Shanti, please help me understand. Please, oh, Shanti, I didn't understand. Like this thing, it's been consistent in my career. And so part of how I started even learning to unlearn was COVID happened and then George Floyd was killed. And I had just left my fiancé, some rich white man. That's why I can talk to white people, because I know us intimately, okay? I know us intimately, unfortunately. Um, But my network now started blowing up. Everybody that he had introduced me to, all these big business white boys in South Africa, I was on the phone for like four hours, five hours with CEOs, whatever, trying to help them understand and grapple with now with what is now going on. I mean, white supremacy has been going on for a long time, but George Floyd really, you know, made the whole world uh, take up uh, and notice, right? And so by the time that two-week period of me just being on the phone with people, taking them through basic things like, you know, you feeling guilty is not your black employee's fault. And so you as the CEO and leader, you cannot take out your fear on your employees because you don't like, you know, things like this. And so I decided to then just like structure that or formalize that. So I give like unlearning white supremacy workshops. I do individual consultations, coachings, like, you know, I speak to do public speaking gigs, et cetera, just so that I can, begin to, because that is energetic work. That's mm. deep spiritual work. That is work for all intent that people like me have not been paid adequately for. That's additional emotional labor for a man that would actually, that should actually pay me for my time. If you're going to take six hours out of my day for me to calm your white guilt, then you should actually pay me, mm. you know? And not to say that in a capitalist or whatever way, but it's to say that I'm, it is taking so much of me. I have to quiet my ancestral rage to help you. Mm. You know, that's what you're asking of me. You're not going to the next white person to ask this question. You're coming to the black lady because you know, I'm going to tell you the truth because <laughs> I know what I'm talking about. And so that's how I structured learning time. And I started to see that there is definitely a need. And part of that is because we don't know our history. We mm. don't know our global history. You know, the history is uncomfortable. And I also was witness to a whole generation of young white people in my country wake up to their ancestral lineage. You know, it's not, I've seen a white boy wake up to the impact of his family history when before that moment, he was just a carefree young boy. Do you understand? That is a painful place to be in. And 
as much as there's, you know, history and all sorts of things, people are people are people and they need to be dealt with with love and with softness and kindness and all of these things that help us grow. Because if you are going to treat me violently because of things my ancestors have done, there's no space for me to grow or to iterate to become a better human, right? And vice versa at the same time is that if you're going to consistently treat me like I'm less than the dirt underneath your shoe, I am going to become violent at some point because I'm a person. I'm a whole human being. You can see that I'm a person. We, we, we bleed the same. You have to go to the bathroom. I have to go to the bathroom. You have to eat. I have to eat. You have to shower. I have to shower. Do you get, we have the same things. So there's an unlearning that has to take place on both ends, which is for, you know, people of color, black people, black South Africans to unlearn this victim mentality. Mm -hmm. And this deference to whiteness and for white people to unlearn their privilege, you know, mm -hmm. because there really, there really is nothing superior about you. Nothing. Like it's a lie. We've both been lied to. <laughs> we both have to heal. Um, and the unlearning. So it's, I think part of why people have always come to me is because I'm able to hold the complexity mm. of what it is, right? Like I can hold both my pain and yours. I can hold both both ends of the spectrum and still manage to engage and connect with love and with kindness. Because at the end of the day, I know how I respond when I'm shouted at or treated badly. I know how I re respond. Any other person is the same because people are people are people. We're the same. Okay. We are all God's children, <laughs> just different colors and flavors and shapes. And that's okay. You know, the world is diverse. It's supposed to be. Hmm. Yeah, Mama. So the so the the final acceptance, and that's why I said at Boom, everybody was lucky because this is my thirty third year. Jesus became Jesus at thirty three. So now I'm like, okay, fine, <laughs> Father God, Father God, if this is what you want me to do, fine, okay. So I finally just surrendered to the universe. It's not that I have control or I have a map as to how to do this. The reluctance is because. Just the responsibility of the task ahead, mm. you know. We are alive in really, really chaotic times. Mm -hmm. And to be someone considered as a leader is a scary thing right now. I don't want to lie to you. It's scary. It is, why can't you choose the next person? I don't know if I want this yeah. burden of responsibility because that's what it is. And one of your questions you had sent to me is like, what do I think true leadership is? Like, leadership is service like you are basically volunteering and telling everyone around you that I am the person who's willing to put all of your needs ahead of my own individual needs mm -hmm. that's what you're saying as a leader and the reason why the world is broken is because all our leaders understand leadership as power over you me being a leader means I can boss you around and that's that's not what it is you know you're also those people Bless them because they're creating the most incredible karma for themselves. And karma, karma does not discriminate. And she is a natural law like gravity. She will come around tenfold. Everything you put out into the universe in a thought form, in a word form, energetically comes back to you manifest times 10. That is a natural law. Like that's not something you can escape. Like the way the sun rises every morning, you know? Mm -hmm. And so understanding this means that if people actually knew what it meant to be a leader, you would not volunteer for that job. You would not volunteer yourself to be responsible and to be in charge of other people because it's it's deep, it's hectic. And also what I said at Boom is that at a spiritual level, whether you believe or don't believe, whether you agree or don't agree, you taking other people's lives into your hands means that at the end of when it's now time for you to account for the actions, that is part of the accountability. You were responsible for 500, 5,000, 5 million people's lives. What did you do? Mm -hmm. Did you protect those lives? Did you enrich those lives? Or did you, you know, denigrate those lives? That is the question and something that leaders will have to account for at a spiritual and karmic level, whether they like that shit or not. It's just, it's just how it is, you know? Um, yeah. And I think that ties into 
the responsibilities of the time and this awakening, tra- talking about awaking youth, mm-hmm. people waking up to the energetic shift, mm-hmm. is now realizing that you're, you're, you are responsible for your life. You, if you're believing in that thought manifest forms, then you are responsible for all your thoughts. And if you, if forms are manifesting in your life that you, you do not like, you have to go back to what you were thinking. That's why the thing about the journal, the daily accounting of what I thought, what I felt, what I did today, because those things manifest and make up your reality, Mm. you know, and for good things, that's amazing because it gives you power that, oh, I'm going to manifest a million dollars. But then for bad things, we don't want to then take the responsibility that we've manifested this negativity in our lives, you mm. know? It goes both ways. Your blessings come in the way you ask for them. Mm. I really appreciate how you invite us to this place of truth. I personally feel that while many of us, hopefully most of us, are aware of the actual times that we're living in, there's just this, I don't know, day-to-day, you know, the pace also of our lives is so fast that we just keep forgetting. But then when you really stop, Mm. you know, and that's what I think I feel that you bring is stop and really feel the weight of the times that we're in. And it's what you're saying that when you really see what is in front of you, it is a responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. And And that's the nature of God's law is that there's no greater sin than knowing better and not doing better. Mm. Those that don't know better are better off than those that see, know, and don't do anything. Mm -hmm. And it's better for you to not know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you also talk about... That's the spiritual accountability I was talking about. Yeah, yeah. 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 And and it's the alignment that you also talk about Mm -hmm. in your work of the head, the heart, and the hand, the doing. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And the courage of conviction. I love this. The courage of conviction. So my question to you, (laughs) clearly as someone who opens up to, yes, the beauty of the world and the pain of this world and the truth that we're in collectively and individually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do you, Shanti, cultivate this courage of conviction? How do you keep going? You just have to, ma'am, because courage only happens in the middle of the doing. Mm. You only, the courage, it's, it's only called courage when you're afraid and you do it anyway. You have to walk up to the lion and you'll find that the lion was simply a little kitten. But because mm. you were far away, it looked so big. You just have to keep going, you know? And this is why I asked the question, if you are in a leadership position, did you choose this life or did life choose you? Because it has to be a calling. Me, the reason why I do the work that I do is because if I don't do the work, I have no peace. God, God bothers me. Like he bothers me. I get bothered by the universe. Okay. <laughs> like things start to not work out. And like, so I don't want stress. So I'm not here because I have a, yes, I do have a big heart and I love everybody, but I'm more concerned about me mm-hmm. having peace. Okay. And how I get peace is by doing the work that I've been called to do. Because when I'm in that space, when I'm in alignment with what my spirit is telling me to do, what my mind is articulating the plans for and what my hands are itching to do, then I'm at my most resonance. That is me at my godly. Like you saw me, that stage at Boom, I was in complete alignment with the universe. Like that was the divine feminine world talking through me. That was not Chanti at all because I was, I found the courage to step up on the stage and do the thing that I was asked to do, right? And that's where the courage is, is like, just step up to the lion. Just step up to the lion. There's nothing, because the devil is a liar, you know? Satan is a liar, guys. You must call his bluff. I promise you. Mm. The, the forces, the forces of light. Oh, just now remembered a saying. Shadows only appear where light is. There's, if there's no light, Mm -hmm. there are no shadows, right? So the darker the shadow, that you are facing, understand that the brighter your light is, the, it's, uh, the darkness is equivalent to the brightness of your light. So don't fear shadows. See them and know that, ah, oh, 
So this is also how I deal with problems. Sorry, because I'm also getting excited. Me and God <laughs> had a conversation today to say that the bigger the the bigger the problem, the bigger the blessing. Mm. So get excited at hardship because know that God is about to, or your Buddha, whoever the God is you pray to, the universe is about to bless you to the same size as the issue you're facing. So welcome problems as they appear in your life because your task in the midst of that issue is to seek the blessing. Same as when I say that a natural law is the sun will rise and the sun will set. Mm -hmm. There's a problem, there's a blessing. They go together. You can never, ever have perpetual winter. It doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. You just have to prepare for the winter during the summer. Mm -hmm. And remember that summer is coming during the winter. We oftentimes forget that the sun rises during winter because it's also dark and you can't see past the darkness. Mm -hmm. They go together, you know, mm -hmm. they go together. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, my next question, and it's related to what you were touching on about mm. leadership, is personal. Who do you long to become as a person, human being, oh. and as a leader? Oh, mama, simply just myself, eh? Mm. Like, I'm already, like, I'm already a lot. I can't be anyone else but me. And so I wish to grow up into a woman that just fully, fully at peace with herself, knowing who I am. Things do not move me that do not concern me. And every stress, every disease, every anxiety, I give it up to the universe because I humbly, humbly only accept perfect conditionalities over my life, you know? Mm -hmm. That's who I want to. Someone who exists in bliss at all times. Like, it really, it doesn't matter what is happening anywhere, anyhow, I'm just in a con constant state of bliss. That's who I want to grow up mm -hmm. to become because that's, that's what God promises. That's what the universe promises. That's what intuition promises when you follow intuition we all know the well, I don't know if we all know but do you know the consequences of not listening to your intuition because that that small still voice that's God that's mm. the universe that's that's your perfect divine design that small still voice in you that's the intelligence that knows when to inhale and when to exhale that's the that's the still infinite intelligence that, that knows how to grow your hair you know You don't do any of those things, but you're doing them. So there's just peace. That's what I want to become. Just nothing disturbs me. I'm in a constant state of bliss. I probably seem delusional to the rest of the world, and that's perfectly okay. You guys can keep your reality. Don't bring your outside food into my house. I don't want it. <laughs> Drop the mic. Thank you, Ashanti. <laughs> No, we actually, I actually had this conversation. I had this conversation with my friend the other day about the nature of reality. He was just like, Shanti, you're not being realistic. And I said, if I was realistic, I would never have achieved half of the things that I've achieved in my life. Like realistic does not apply to me. And this thing about don't allow small logic to trump your big magic. Follow your intuition. Follow the things that are inside of you because that. Whatever that is, whatever that fire, that impetus, that energy is that's, that's in you, it's more powerful than anything, anything out there. And that is the true self. That is your true self coming to the fore. And I know a lot of people don't listen to their inner voice because it's always, it's your conscious. It's always telling you when you've overstepped also, because mm -hmm. you always know when you're doing the right thing. This mm -hmm. is why I don't agree with people who say that, you know, morality is blurred. No, it's not. You know when you're doing the right thing. You know when you're doing the wrong thing. Your body tells you, your spirit tells you, because spirit is always for good, for light. So when you're doing the wrong thing, you know you're doing the wrong thing. You're just so used to shutting off that voice, so used to shutting off that side that you've become numb to it, but it's still there, mm. you know. Morality isn't uh wavy we 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 come in built with this thing we know the thing is wrong we know you know you know yeah. you just do it anyway it, and that's also okay mm -hmm. you know just pick a lane and own who you are one of my i i at university i used to have this friend sorry and i'll keep quiet because i'm getting excited 
everybody used to not like this guy because he was just so rude all the time. And I'm like, no, me and Ian, we are straight, bro, because Ian doesn't lie to you about who he is. I'm an asshole and that's it. Like you either take, take it or leave it. This is just how I am. And that person is more honest than someone who pretends to be kind when they're not. Mm. You know what I mean? Someone who pretends to be away when they're not. He is more honest. So just figure out who you are, own it, and that's it. Keep it moving. <laughs> no one's going to judge you. No one's yeah. going to judge you. We're all in this existential crisis together. That's the issue. Ashanti Kunene is a social justice activist, a poet, a decolonial dialogue facilitator, a published writer and the founder of Learning to Unlearn. To learn more about her work, you can visit learningtounlearn.com or follow iArtShanti on Instagram. Waking Youth is a podcast and a newsletter that you can find more about at wakingyouth.substack.com. Our theme music was composed by Carlos Sierra, who also edits our episodes, and I'm Carlota Gitch. If you like this episode, I invite you to share it with someone you think might appreciate it and check out the written piece that accompanies it on the show notes. Last but not least, thank you for your presence and talk to you soon. Bye!